Hey, welcome everybody. Good to see you today. Did you enjoy that extra hour of sleep or just coffee time this morning or whatever? Will did. Good job, Will. Um, hey, Halloween was this week, uh, so just a moment of honesty if you're a parent. Uh, how many of you just, you just own it? You have stolen candy from your children without them knowing about it this week from their candy stash. That's right. Okay, it's not stealing. It's called child tax. Like they, it's not free to raise a kid and they got a pony up. Whether they're aware of it or not, that's up to them. But yeah, so we had, um, we had some, a uh, little bit of trick-or-treating in our house. We've got our 10-year-old daughter, Madeline, um, M, who was quite excited about it. And then we had our grandkids were also there. So we've got uh, three and almost two. So my three-year-old granddaughter, Juniper, um, she was a rainbow unicorn and uh, was just so, she looked super cute. So afterwards, we're done. Um, we spent about an hour trick-or-treating. We're back at the house. And, um, and I look over, and Juniper's got a handful of M&Ms, and I, I, I did some quick math. There were nine of them. She had nine M&Ms in her hand, and she was just like in heaven, right? I mean, there's candy everywhere, and, and she's got a handful of M&Ms. And I said, oh, what do you got? She goes, M&Ms. And I said, great. I said, can Papa have some? And she goes, sure. And she then had to make a choice. Like, how many M&Ms is she going to give to Papa? She gave me six of her nine. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, wow. And of course, I ate them all. I didn't give any back. Just consume those. <laughs> And she was like, sure. And then, like, then she like, grabbed the Twix and put a Twix in my hand. Like, she was just giving candy away. It was like candy for everybody. It was just like wonderful. Well, I've got a 10-year-old daughter, Madeline. And so Madeline has some Skittles. And um, she had about 10 Skittles. And so I said, oh, honey, can, can Daddy have some Skittles? And she says, um, sure. Any guesses? Two. I got two <laughs> Skittles out of 10. That's 20%. 66% of the granddaughter, like, what happens between three years old and 10 years old? Because you felt it, didn't you? Like, you, you remember, you may have, but there was a time where you're like, candy for everybody, and suddenly you're 10, she's like, man, I've, you're, you're 10 years old, and you've got 10 uh, Skittles or whatever they are, and you're like, man, if I give you any, I'm going to have less, and I'm going to run out, and there's this tension, and I wish I could say that you and I will outgrow that at some point in our lives, but that tension always stays there. We're going to talk about that tension Today We're in this series, it's called Best Life Ever, and the premise of the series is to remind you what it's about. Uh, Jesus, when he came to earth, um, he talked about coming to earth to give us a life that is like the fullest, best possible life ever. Um, a life like you and I could never possibly imagine without him. And we compare the life that Jesus promised to the life that most of us are experiencing every day, and we discover there's a pretty big gap between what could be and what is. Not just with like the, you know, random uh, average people in the world, like, it, it, like you and me, like for, for followers of Jesus, it's no different uh, from those that don't follow Jesus. Like even followers of Christ are not experiencing the very life that Christ said he came to bring them. And so we've been asking the question, why? Like, what is it about life that's keeping us from experiencing all that God has in store for us? And what we've said in this series is that one of the challenges is it's the way we think. And so if we can learn to think differently, change our mindsets, or as the Bible says in Romans 12, renew our minds, allow the Holy Spirit to change our thinking, we can begin to live um, at, a, at a higher level because Jesus changes our heart in an instant when we ask him to. But our mind takes a while. It lags behind. And our, our thinking takes time to, to shift. And so we've gone through a bunch of mindsets that if we will live into these statements um, can make a big difference in our life. We talked about relationship first. That that's what we are. We are relationship first people. Um, we've talked about um, that perfection is a myth. That was another mindset. Perfection is a myth. Progress is what God's interested in, not your perfection. You'll never be perfect. He's the only perfect one. So let's just let go of that. Um, we discover that rest is a gift. And in rest, we find a reminder of God's goodness and his provision in our lives. Um, we talked about joy being a choice that we can choose in spite of circumstances and how that affects our life in a positive way. Um, we discovered that we're people that choose courage over fear that our goal isn't to get rid of fear, it's to have courage in spite of our fear, to rise above it and to move ahead, ahead anyway. Um, last week we talked about, um, Ron did a great job teaching about it's not mine. This mindset that says whatever's in my hands actually isn't mine, it's all God's, he owns it all, I don't own anything, I'm just going to use it in a way that glorifies him. And then today we're going to continue with um, our today's mindset, I'll give it to you right here, it's that I have enough. I have enough. Would you say that with me? I have enough. That lacked passion, which says, which, which says, I'm glad you're here today. So hopefully at the end, we'll have a chance to repeat it later. We'll see if we can develop a little gusto between now and then. I have enough. That's a powerful mindset for you and I to adopt. Here's why. I think most of us look at what we have and we come to the conclusion that what I have is not enough. 
And don't think for a moment uh, just specifically about your possessions or your money. I mean, that's a part of this, so you can keep that in mind if you'd like today, but don't let that be the limiter. I'm talking about everything in your life. Like you look at what you have and you go, I just don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time to get done what I need to get done. I don't have enough energy level. Um, I don't have um, enough relationships or, uh, or, or like friendships. At work, I don't have enough opportunities. I don't have enough support or love around me. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the skills. I don't have the experience. I don't have the brains that I need. And everything we look at, we just, I just don't have enough. Can anyone relate to this? And we start to sell ourselves short. And what happens is the more we think that we don't have enough, the more we begin to live like we don't have enough, right? Because we believe it. And it becomes like this self-fulfilling prophecy. And so maybe at one point you actually did. You, you, you knew you were enough, but now because you've told yourself this so many times, you literally live into this reality of every environment you go into, every conversation you have with someone, every situation, you approach it knowing that you're like, or believing that you're like already at a deficit before the thing even starts. I'm not going to be able to be what this person needs me to be. I, I can't really do this moment. I, my boss asked this of me. My coach wants this. My teacher, I, I can't. I just don't have enough and you and I actually talk ourselves out of the very things God is calling us into. God invites us in and we're like, yeah, but I, I can't. And that, that kind of thinking that I don't have enough or I'm not enough leads to what today we're just going to call a scarcity mentality. You've probably heard that language before. A scarcity mindset that says I don't have enough. God wants to invite you and I into an abundance mindset. So I just want for a moment to talk about the difference between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset because they're very, very different. And you're probably going to connect right away with this as I go through this little list. You're going to resonate with one of these lists more than the other. Um, you, I won't ask you to say it out loud, but you'll know. So let's talk about scarcity for a moment. Scarcity mindset sees resources as finite. And by resources, I mean tangible and intangible, things you can hold, but also things that you have in your heart, emotions, feelings like that. Like there's a sense of there's only so much to go around. That means that I win, you lose. If you win, I lose. That means if I get one, you don't, right? There's this sense of there's only so many M&Ms or Skittles to go around and, and I gotta be careful. Um, whereas an abundant mindset sees resources as infinite. There's no limit on that. There's plenty for all of us. Um, here's another side of, of scarcity mindset. Um, it says this, if I share, I'll run out. If I just keep giving away, there won't be any left for me. Whereas an abundance mindset says if I share, I'll be fine. I'm gonna be okay. A scarcity mindset is anxious about tomorrow. Oh, there's unknowns tomorrow, and, and so there's anxiety and nervousness, whereas an abundance mindset is excited about tomorrow. You know why? It's because the future, if you have a scarcity mindset, means nothing but more problems. Tomorrow's going to bring problems. I got enough problems today. I can't deal with more problems tomorrow. Whereas an abundance mindset sees the future, and they're excited because there's new opportunities. It's like totally different way to approach life. This mindset and this mindset will lead to very different places. And you've probably found that to be true. And again, right now, you're probably resonating with one of those more than the other. You're like, yeah, that's more me than I wish it was. Or I'm, maybe that is me and I'm ex excited. There's a tension there. Because I'll tell you, one of these two mindsets will, um, will lead you to draw back, to close off, and hold on tight. The other one will push you outward. It will open you up and it will release your grip. And your mindset, scarcity or abundance, will follow you everywhere you go. It's like that the dog, you know, that lost dog that is just trying to go home. with. It's like, I'm going to go home with you. Wherever you're going, I'm going. And there your mindset follows. So you go to work, you take your scarcity mentality or your abundance mentality with you. And it affects your relationships. You bring it home with you to your spouse, your kids, your brothers, your sisters, your parents. You take it to school with you. You take it um, to your sports team to practice. Everywhere you go, your mindset follows you. And so I want to encourage us today to be people of abundance. If you feel scarcity in your heart, today is an invitation to embrace abundance. And here's why. Because we serve a God of abundance. We do. You ought to smile right now when you heard that. Like we serve, as followers of Jesus, a God of abundance. If you don't know that, let me just explain how we know this. Have you been outside recently? I mean, it's been cold and wet. But beyond that, we are surrounded by God's beauty. I mean, if you are one who believes that creation, uh, that, that God created the heavens and the earth, that he spoke and it is, then everywhere you look, you see a reminder of God's abundance. God didn't create just enough abundance, or I'm sorry, just enough creation for us to go, oh, look, that's nice. 
No, he just created beauty everywhere that we look. Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, verse 10, it's an important verse for us as a church. It's kind of where we get our mission and even the whole point of the series. Jesus said, I have come so that you could have life and have it to the full. Jesus says, that's why I'm here, so that you could have full, abundant, overwhelming life, like the best life you could possibly imagine. I didn't come to give you a just barely get by kind of life. No, I want you to have the best life you can imagine. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 speaks of God, and it says that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask, hope for, or imagine. Like whatever you think God could do, he can blow it away. That is the kind of God we serve, a God of abundance. And so it's actually in God's abundance that you and I find our abundance. That, 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 I'll say it this way. Because God is enough, I have enough. Like in, my, in and of myself, I, I don't think I have enough. But because God is enough and he is my source, because God is enough, I have enough. If you have a Bible, you can open it to Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to read a story from the Old Testament today um, that will help us understand how God works in our lives. And we're going to go to the New Testament and look at another story that will be helpful. Exodus 16 is, um, here's the background. 30 days before we're about to read what we're going to read, 30 days earlier, the people of Israel have left Egypt where they've been enslaved for hundreds of years. Moses has led them out of slavery through the Red Sea. Miraculously, God part of the Red Sea. They cross. They, uh, they're now wandering or walking through the desert on the way to the promised land. And, and after 30 days, as you can imagine, they begin to run low on supplies, right? You can only take so much food with you while you're traveling. And so they're starting to get low. People are getting a little hungry. Supplies are, are limited. And so the people of Israel do what they're really, really good at. It was one of their spiritual gifts. Maybe some of you have the spiritual gift of complaining. <laughs> they have the spiritual gift of complaining. And so they're like, Moses, why'd you bring us out here to try to kill us? Why didn't, you just kill it? Why didn't God kill us in Egypt? Like, why kill us in the desert? Like, in Egypt, we had meat and bread. They forgot they were slaves for a moment. They're just, they're just really wanting some meat and bread. Hunger will make you think crazy things, right? They want meat and bread, and now we're going to die out here. And Moses, of course, hears their, their concerns and their They're complaining, and so does God, and so God responds to Moses, not to the people, but to Moses, and we'll pick up in verse four with the story. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food. That's actually a pretty abundant phrase right there, rain down food from heaven for you. Each day, the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. As much food as they need for that day. That's an important line. Actually, thousands or maybe 1,500 years later, Jesus would be with his disciples. And his disciples would say to him, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus would pray for his, and t- teach his disciples to pray. It's a prayer that we have. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And there's a line in that prayer. Maybe you've heard it before. It goes like this. You can finish it when I start it. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. The most famous prayer in the world. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is alluding back to this story of a time when God would provide as much food as they needed for that day. This this daily allotment that would cover their needs, that would remind them who their source is. As much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Verse 5 says, On the sixth day they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening, you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaint, which are not against, I'm sorry, which are against him, not against us. Like, what have we done that you should complain about us? Like Moses is a little defensive. Maybe you can relate to that as a parent or teacher or, or a leader. But Moses added, the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning. For he has heard all your complaints against him. (laughs) What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. I hope you could tell who the main focus of those four verses are right there. I I underlined them for emphasis if you missed it. (laughs) The Lord. He's like, the Lord led you out of Egypt. The Lord's glory will be shown tomorrow. The Lord will provide you with food to eat. The Lord has heard your complaints, which are against him. Like, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about my thing or your thing or what we're trying to do. Like, it's all about what the Lord is up to. Like, our eyes are being invited to lift up 
away from this to this. And that is such a good principle for us to understand when it comes to scarcity and abundance. You and I will never rise above scarcity in our lives if we're looking to ourselves or each other for what we need. If, if I'm expecting you to provide something for me, this is such a good statement. Like if you're in a relationship and there's a sense that, oh, this relationship with so-and-so, he's a great guy or this girl or, you know, it doesn't matter how young or old we are. If there's a sense of they give me what I need, you have a scarcity mentality and you will find disappointment there because they cannot provide you with everything you need. No human being is capable of doing that in our lives. It's when we lift our eyes off of this to God and we see him as the one who led us out of where we were, who provides for us what we need. It's his glory that matters. It's, it's he that we speak to. That's where abundance begins to come into our lives. It goes on in verse, um, I think it's verse 13. That evening, a vast number of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it's the food the Lord has given you to eat. We're going to jump ahead to verse 31 because there's a little uh, explanation. It says, the Israelites called the food manna. It was white like coriander seed and, and tasted like honey wafers. The, the word manna in Hebrew literally is translated, what is it? So when they're like, what is it? It's like, remember who's on first? Like, what is it? Yes. No, I mean, what is it? Exactly. Exactly what? That's exactly what it is. That's what it is? Yep. What is it? That's what they called it. They had no name for it. They just called it this. Let's keep, uh, go back to verse, I think, 18 or 16. These are the Lord's instructions, Moses gives them. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. I love this. God built into Israel's daily rhythms a constant reminder of his abundance. Like every 24 hours, there was this cycle of his abundance. You know, the Old Testament speaks of verses, it talks about how God's mercies are new every morning, that they would see that God is their provision, that God is their source. He was their provider. And I love, once again, that it was a daily provision. The passage makes it so clear, like just enough for today. They weren't allowed to keep any of it, like left over till the next day. Matter of fact, if they did, look what verse 19 says, what happened. Um, it's, Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. Like you can't, you got to use it that day. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its needs. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation because they weren't supposed to do that. And he told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest. A holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. We talked about Sabbath a few weeks ago in our series. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left over for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. It's so hard for us to understand what this would have been like for the people of Israel. Because we, you know, we live in you know, apartments and homes and we you know, have garages or cars and we go to grocery stores. They would walk out of their tent in the morning. And they would visibly, physically with their eyes, see God's provision for the day, covering the ground. I mean, every single day they were reminded, God's here. He's, he's meeting uh, you. He's, he's providing what you need. And I love, and I hadn't really processed this so clearly before, um, but it's very clear from the story. God, every single day, put more manna on the ground than they actually needed. Did you catch that little detail? Like, it wasn't like there was enough manna for everybody to get two quarts. And so, like, if you got up late or your alarm didn't go off, it was daylight savings and you kind of missed the window, you, you get out there late and you're like, oh no, and you're trying to find scraps to put together two quarts. No, no, no. There was more than enough for everybody. Just, he's like, here's more than you need for the day. I'm just going to provide it. 
Is it being wasted? Nope, I'm going to provide some more tomorrow. And he would just put it everywhere. And, and I think that reality of all this extra manna on the ground was, again, a daily reminder for the people of Israel to just fight against that scarcity in their hearts, that, that desire to say like, oh, but what if there's none tomorrow? Maybe I'll grab a little bit more. What if I just fill up a little, an extra little container full? What, what if we get attacked by, by an army tomorrow? What if there's a, a storm or there's a windstorm or there's rain? What if God gets busy or distracted? He forgets. I mean, he's got a lot going on. Like, what if? And as they watched the sun come up and it all melted away, it was like, no. Tomorrow God will provide. He's a God of abundance. He gave us more than we needed. We had plenty today. And it could be trusted tomorrow. This went on for 40 years. It says, so the people of Israel ate manna 40 years. It's a long time. <laughs> Just acknowledge that for a moment. Wow. Until they arrived at the land where they would settle. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. You know, 40 years earlier, they were too afraid to cross into the Canaan and take the land God had given them. They didn't believe they had enough. We can't do it. People are too big. We're not, we're not enough. And it was only after 40 years of daily dependence on God, being reminded that he is their source, he's their provision, that he is enough, and in him they are enough, that they arrived at the promised land once again saying, we're ready. Because they understood who the source was. God is enough, and in him we are and we have enough. You get to the New Testament, and Jesus comes. And Jesus, as God, expresses and embraces the same spirit of abundance that we see in the in God of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Jesus' first miracle is, is a great story of his abundance and the kind of life he came to bring. Um, it's in John chapter 2. If you've never read it before, it's a cool little story. I'll just give you the background. Jesus is at a, at a wedding party, and um, his friends are there. His disciples are there. Um, his, his, we know his mom, maybe other family members probably were there. And everybody's having a great time. Right? Weddings at the time, these are multiple day celebrations. Like, it's just a lot of fun for everybody to be together. And at some point, murmurs begin that apparently they've run out of wine. Now, I don't know if you've ever hosted like a wine-friendly party or a, or a wedding, but that, you'd be embarrassed if that happened, right? You'd be like, ah, oh. it's like, oh, shoot. Well, in this particular time, in the first century, it was more than embarrassing. It was like unacceptable. This would have been um, like, like can't, the family would have thought, can we recover from this? Like this was, this is horrible news. Because in the Old Testament, wine was always a symbol of gladness. It was a, it was a symbol of joy, of like God's goodness, and blessing in people's life. So if the wine has run out, then the most joyous occasion in the village has run out. There's a sense of like, it's, it's over. Well, word gets to Jesus, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 6 with what happened. It says, standing near, uh, nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. You're going to have to do some math. Get ready. Each of the six stone jars could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars have been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. By the way, can you imagine being a servant? You've just been asked by some stranger. Nobody really knew who Jesus was in terms of, they, they might have known him relationally, but they didn't know he was the son of God. He had not come like into that moment yet and announced who he was. So like in their mind, some random guy at the party is like, hey, can you fill these jars up? And they're like, sure. And then he's like, hey, can you go give some to the master of ceremonies who's expecting wine? They're like, no. Like, they're looking for, like, the new kid. Like, who doesn't have enough? Like, you go, Bill. It's your first time here. Bill's like, I'm not doing it. You guys. And there's this little argument. Finally, somebody does it because it says the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. And here's what he said to the bridegroom. He said, a host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone's had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. You ever tried that trick? No, don't raise your hand. But we get it. We're like, yeah, if they've had a little too much, like it's, they don't understand. He says, but not you. You have kept the best until now. You kept the best until now. Bridegroom's like, you better believe I did. <laughs> I have no idea how that happened, right? He's, he, he has no idea where the wine came from. See, the wine runs out. Jesus gets involved. And Jesus holds nothing back, does he? Nothing back. Like, it's no accident that the scriptures are very clear about the number of jars and how many gallons each one could have. You have to ask yourself when you read a detail like that in the Bible, like, why does it say that? Why couldn't it just say there were six jars? No, there, there, were, or there were some jars. By, no, there were six jars that could hold up to 30. 
30 gallons a piece, and you're all good at math, you know that's how many gallons? It tells us exactly how many gallons of wine Jesus made. That's 900 bottles if you convert it. You tell me, scarcity or abundance? Thank you. Abundance. Here's what scarcity is. Scarcity, scarcity shows up at the party with um, one of those little like uh, yolks or Super One or, or Safeway like six packs. You get 10% off of like two bucks chuck. Like here's my six bottles of wine. I found, I found the 9.99 bot rack and I just kind of, hopefully this will help. Like this will get us through the night. It's just six. It's cheap. No, no one's going to notice anyway. That's scarcity. Jesus doesn't do that. No, Jesus, God in the flesh, God on earth, incarnate, like this is God. God shows up with 75 cases of Chateau Lafitte. Like <laughs> that, is a, that is a pallet and a half of wine. Why? Because he's a God of abundance. And part of that miracle, I mean, there's a lot that the miracle teaches us. Part of that miracle, I think, says a lot about Jesus is, is announcing to the world, I'm bringing something that no one's brought before. I'm bringing a life and a freedom and a joy and a fullness that this world has never seen. And I'm not just going to kind of get you by. I am going to lavish more than you need. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine people are like taking extra bottles home or they didn't have bottles, but wine skins are just like, we got so much wine. What are we going to do? There was this sense of gladness and goodness and overwhelm that Jesus poured on the party because he's a God of abundance. He provides more than we need. He provides us every day with enough. And because God is enough, I'll say it one more time. I have enough. Let's try to say it with me. I have enough. Wow. Just whatever you're facing today, you have enough. Greatest expression of God's abundance was the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, in Jesus, we find everything we need. And, and, and he didn't just send them. He had sent angels before. God had sent messengers, and um, he had sent prophets, and, and all that. But, but all of that was never like an end of itself. It was always preparing the way for this particular gift, the gift of his son. And in Jesus, God gave himself the best he had to give. And in Jesus, we find full forgiveness. It's not like he's like, hey, I'm going to die for some of your sins, but not the really bad ones. Those are really bad. And, and, uh, and I want you to experience you know, good things, but not too many good things. No, he just pours complete forgiveness and, and wholeness on our life. And he redeems all of our pasts, all of our hurts and our habits and our hangups. And in him, we find everything we need to live a life of, of like just meaning and significance and purpose. This is, this is Jesus. When we give our lives to him, we invite him in. in. He, just, he just pours abundance, more than we need, exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask for, hope, or imagine. And remember, please, once again, I'm not talking just about like your socioeconomic world, like how much do I have financially? No, no, no. That is why a single parent who's struggling to pay his or her bills, who has an abundance mentality, is experiencing and can't experience in that moment. And I, I could talk, we could talk about that as a community because I know some of you, you're experiencing your best life ever. And then you've got another couple, middle-aged couple making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, paid for house, and they've got a scarcity mentality, and they are so far away from the life that God created them to live. We understand that to be true. It's about our mindset. And Jesus pours his abundance into us so that we can experience his abundance and so that we can become extensions of his abundance in the lives of others. You know, Ron talked about this last week, that we're not called to be reservoirs that just kind of receive and hold. We're called to be rivers. Where it comes to us, we receive and we just pass it on. It was never ours in the first place. This is what God wants you to be, an expression of his abundance in the life of your family, your coworkers, your classmates, your roommates, sports team, your neighbors. That as freely as you have received, you give. You receive and then you give with no expectation of return. And you're just open and free. There's no scarcity when it comes to how you love other people. Because you're not going to run out. There's no scarcity when it comes to how free you are with forgiveness and grace and kindness. The kind words and encouraging words just are like, they're so frequent in your life. You're not going to run out. Moments of compassion. It just becomes a part of who you are as you love and give of who you are to other people. I'm just going to let God's spirit and his goodness and his abundance flow through me. There's a reason why a three-year-old would give her papa 
six pieces of her nine pieces of candy. It's not just because I'm a great papa. That's probably part of it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you why. Because two, I mean, last year, she's like, what's happening? There's like, Halloween's confusing to kids. But at three, it's, un, it's unreal. Because an hour, here's why she shared that much with me. An hour beforehand, she had nothing. Right? She's standing there looking cute in her little costume, and she's got her little bucket, and it's empty. And then we start knocking on people's doors, strange houses she's never been to before. And people open the door, and they're like, wow! They look at her with a huge smile, and they just start putting candy in her. And she's like, this is incredible. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it from the eyes of a three-year-old. This never happens. And my, my mom's letting me eat this, and this is, like, encouraged. And, and then, like, let's go to the next house. And, and at one point, we had to empty the bucket because it was too full. Like, an hour ago, she had nothing. And now she's like, there's candy everywhere. When Pop asked for some M&M's, she's like, of course, I've got candy. Like, I can't even contain it all. Man, I think, this, the, I think Jesus is inviting us back to that, friends. The mind of a three-year-old that, that had a sense of, man, I had nothing and Allison I've received. And, and I guess she, she probably thought if I ran out, I'll just go knock on the neighbor's house again and maybe they'll have more. <laughs> like, she's just like, I'm, I'm okay. I think I'm going to be, if I share it, I'll have enough. I'll be okay. I'll have more than I need. If I run out, I, I bet Nana and Papa will help me find some more. I'm like, of course we will. Like, we'll figure this out, girl. Can we come back to that place where we're just appreciative for me? And I had nothing, and God has in his abundance given to me, and so I have enough. Lord, how do you want me to share my life with other people? Let me pray for us about that. If you just kind of go to an attitude of prayer, and I'll just say this to you as you start to kind of shift your mind. Um, if scarcity is something that you realize you're struggling with today. And I know there's plenty of us in this room who, if we're honest, would say, yeah, that's where I go. You're invited to let go of that mindset today, to change the way you think, to allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind and, and to, to embrace the abundance you have in God. We serve a God of abundance because he is enough, I have, and I am enough. It's not self-serving or about me. It's about what he has done for me. Just have a conversation with him about that right now. He's going to listen to you. Jesus, thank you so much for hearing our, our prayers and for modeling for us the kind of abundance and generosity that you desire. I mean, I pray, Lord, that even this week, like we would just be so quick to step in and to give from our like reserves into others. That we would just encourage and speak hope and life and strength into one another that we would just share anything that comes our way in life, realizing that it's been given to us not to hold, but to pass on. And may that just cover every part of our lives. We can, we can do this because you, Jesus, gave us all of yourself on the cross. You, you held nothing back. You sacrificed your life freely for ours. And by acknowledging your sacrifice and trusting in that it was more than just the death of an innocent man, it was... It was a gift that provides forgiveness for the sins of the world. The one that we had sinned against offers us forgiveness and a new, new start. So we thank you for that, God, and we receive that in a fresh way this morning. Some, once again, were reminded of your grace and mercy. Others of us, maybe today's our very first day to say, Jesus, I trust in you. You died for me, and I embrace that. Forgive me. Make me new. Lead me from this day forward. Help us this week, Father, to look for those opportunities to pass on to others the abundance that we have in you. Jesus, thanks so much for your love, loving us for who we are, not for what we do. For that, we're so grateful. We pray all of this in your strong and abundant name, the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen together. Amen. amen.